This debate is intended to ask, are there limits on freedoms of expression? And if so, what might those limits be? Without further ado, let's move to the first proposition speaker, Cass Caldecott. Cass is a second year undergraduate student reading law at Trinity College. They won the right to speak through open audition. Cass, you have the ears of the house. Well, first of all, good evening, members of the chamber. And wow, oh wow, are there quite a lot of you. And quite thankfully, most of the friends I asked to show up. So you can't complain too much. It's lovely to be before you all this evening. And I'll get right onto it. The first thing it's vital for me to do is to clarify my exact stance on this debate, which is rather different from what will have immediately come to mind for most when this motion was read. I'll be talking about what I view to be the pinnacle right to offend. And so I'll move on to clarify this definition. And first of all, I'm not majorly challenging the general rights of free speech, which naturally include a right to offend. However, of course, this does not entail freedom from the consequences of the offense, as I'm sure members of the House will be aware. So this pinnacle form to offend, the right to offend in aid of what is just, and the right to offend for development, is what I'll be talking about to you, this House, tonight. So first of all, we believe that a, the, the pinnacle right to offend is targeted against those in power. It is done with thought and purpose, and it is done in service of a progressive political agenda. So the first prime example tonight, which I'm sure the sympathies and support of the whole chamber will go out to, is the woman protesting in Iran. They're perhaps the utmost example of anyone currently exercising the right to offend. They're most brilliantly acting in wonderful defiance against a tyrannous regime through cutting their hair, removing their headscarves, burning them. They are acting with thought and purpose against a truly deplorable government. And that, this house, is one of the pinnacle examples I think that I've seen in my lifetime of the right to offend. Who <laughs> decides to allocate this right to offend? This is a, I'm not talking about a right to offend that necessarily needs to be allocated, and as it as all views will, will always ultimately come down to the individual. But it's a, a consideration people should keep in mind and one people should try and aim for when they are making their protests. And so now for a more historical example, for an example I'm sure our intervener won't disagree with. An example of some incredibly brave people who no doubt offended a great many people in taking an incredibly bold step, the Little Rock Nine. They had the courage to offend an incredibly dominant and oppressive racial majority at the time. They undeniably knew and intended the political importance of their attendance. And it was in service of one of the most identifiable and important political movements in the last century and maybe in much more time than that. And good on them. Again, I'm sure no member of the House would begrudge me thinking of them as an example of the pinnacle right to offend. Uh, I completely agree to you that it was morally righteous and trying to bring people together and in furtherance of something wholeheartedly good. But there is no doubt that it would have been deeply offensive to many other people there. I mean, the National Guard were called in in this and similar cases to defend these people going to school. If that's not a sign that you've offended some people, I'm afraid, dear intervener, I don't know what is. And so this brings me on to my final example, which will be one I'll probably spend the most of my time on. And this is the case of trans people and other LGBT plus identified people in the UK. Those who offend through their identity, those who the mere facts of their existence are the tool by which they offend through choice or through not. Trans and LGBT plus people in the UK currently face countless indignities against them from civilian and government alike. I myself have done countless amounts of looking over my shoulder. I've done countless amounts of walking home in the dark scared. I've done countless amounts of dealing with people making truly awful comments to me who I had done absolutely nothing towards but look and dress a certain way. The environment for trans people, in particular in the UK at present, is abhorrent and the hatred perpetuated by certain people in this room should be a damning indictment on them. And now, 
it's obvious from the lineup of this debate that this discussion is unavoidable. And I suppose better to head it off at the pass. And I would like to begin my discussion with the preface that I do not believe trans rights are up for debate. And I believe the union was it wrong to invite Dr. Stock and, and risk shifting. and risk shifting what otherwise could have been nothing more than a meaningful and insightful debate about free speech onto what I'm having to do before the House this evening. Thank you for the laugh, Dr. Stock. Um, I'm sure most of this chamber have been told by their parents, you can do something does not mean you should. And I think that's a pinnacle example here. I will, of course, note that free speech and the relative rights allow Dr. Stock and others to say the things they do. But just because you can does not mean you should. And free speech certainly does not mean, no thank you, freedom from the consequences of said speech. I will also add that for the sake of not falling into what Dr. Stock would no doubt consider the common pitfalls of her distractors by misunderstanding her argument. Simply put, the fundamental nature of what makes someone a man and what makes someone a woman is our key point of contention, or gender theory, as I believe is the term Dr. Stock uses in particular. And make no mistake, I do absolutely and wholeheartedly disagree with Dr. Stock's ruminations on this topic. But as mentioned, I will not be debating them on the principle that trans rights are not up for debate, and I do not wish to waste my limited time at this box arguing an issue on which neither of us will change our views based on what the other could possibly say. Instead, this evening, I will choose to look through the actions of Dr. Stock in particular, namely her Twitter presence and of those she supports, of which I'll be looking at two chief examples in the LGB Alliance and JK Rowling. I will, following this examination, conclude that the people she actively supports and the things she has herself said do nothing short of harming an already incredibly vulnerable group of the population. The LGB Alliance, who I will start with first, is an organization that has done and said numerous awful things, such as the opposition of gay marriage, in particular making the rather interesting claim that the LGBT rights movement has never demanded the change of laws in the UK. They have criticized the campaign to make conversion therapy illegal. They've stood against LGBT inclusive education, engaged in a series of biphobic comments, and opposed the existence of LGBT clubs in schools due to, and this one, this one I think will really, really surprise the house of, the risk of predatory gay teachers were the exact words of, I believe, one of the co-founders. And the actions of this group, when combined with Dr. Sock's support of them as both an attendee of their conference and I believe at a time a trustee, will serve to completely undermine any statements made by Dr. Stock in support of the LGBT, no thank you, in support of the LGBT community, and specifically trans people in her book. I do not think of a defense of these comments being made, not being made by Dr. Stock personally is not valid, is valid, or a specific, specific endorsement being absent from her is a valid defense. I think that the support of this organization, which just has far too many examples of doing and saying truly reprehensible things for any support of them, let alone the extent Dr. Stock has gone to, to be defensible. I will now move on to an examination of a few of the, no thank you, saddening things I found in a short scroll of Dr. Stock's Twitter. The retweet, oh, no thank you, the retweet of a tweet, a point of order, yeah, sorry, that's it, My intervening friend is unfortunately mistaken. I am talking about, again, my pinnacle form of the right to offend, and I'm not denying Dr. Stock's right to offend. I'm discussing how we should use our right to offend and how Dr. Stock has not, in my eyes, done this in an appropriate manner. So, as I was saying, I will now move on to an examination of the few of, few of the saddening things I found in a show, thank you, of a short scroll of Dr. Stock's Twitter. The retweet of a tweet claiming that people were falling prey to the gender cult, a tweet endorsing a zine named Why Are So Many Girls Deciding They'd Rather Be Boys? And a retweet of a Times column stating that 
Only a man would think womanhood is a costume you can shed like a pair of high heels. Again, no thank you. Again, Dr. Stock's words in Material Girls that she has friendly sympathy and... Point of order. Yes. Stock, Professor Stock doesn't have time to reply. Does he not have a way to I am making a speech well within my rights on how I view the right to offend should be used and how a specific speaker who the union chose to invite does not conform with these rights. So again, Dr. Stock's words in Material Girls that she has friendly sympathy and respect for trans people are not congruent with her social media presence. A social media presence that thrives on anti-trans sentiment and perfectly demonstrates a poor use of the right to offend. And now, my next point was going to be on support related to J.K. Rowling, but I will move on for the sake of time. And in, in particularly fancy fashion, the f final line I had on this issue was that I will not waste any more time here. It being impossible to say the last word on J.K. Rowling, and no summary of the damage she has caused will ever be an adequate summary. It is simply enough for me to say that her actions and views are abhorrent. So to conclude, as a proud non-binary person, it is impossible to look at the state of modern media and not be miserable. It is impossible to look at the voices taken to be authoritative to on the topic and not be miserable. It is impossible to watch a country move backwards on this issue, especially when it's the country whose historic empire is responsible for the organized destruction of indigenous, trans, and gender non-conforming identities and not be miserable. The right to offend remains unqualified. Trans rights remain not up for debate. Dr. Stock, those she enables and those who enable her disgust me and they should disgust this house.